I think it's been a while. We can go ahead and start the presentation. Okay, so we're going to be talking today about uh, sort of the state of container security. Uh, I did um, this talk at the uh, DevConf check, and uh, this will be a little bit of an update on it. Um, but uh, I think it's a pretty interesting um, uh, I, some ideas that we've been uh, going over. Um, so um, for the at DevCon Check, I actually found that uh, a lot of people in Europe don't know who Goldilocks is, uh, don't know the story of Goldilocks and the three bears. Um, but um, so I had to run a video there. Hopefully, since this is the U.S. one, um, uh, people will understand it. But basically, the, the basic idea of the story is that um, Goldilocks goes in, into a house with three bears. There's a mama bear, a papa bear, and a baby bear. And basically, she, you know, tries to eat some porridge. She, the papa bears is too hot, the mama bears is too cold, and then the baby bears is just right. Um, sits in a chair, the papa bears is too hot, and the mama bears is too soft, and the baby bears is just right. And that's basically the idea is everything she goes through. She's always picking the just right moment of the, uh, of, uh, you know, the, the, the story. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times when we, um, you know, look at container security, um, if we make container security or we make any type of security too hard, um, people just turn the, um, turn the security off. So this, this, you know, if, if we crank up security so high that you can't get your application to work, then you're just going to turn it off. Um, and then if we make, um, you know, security too soft, um, basically, you know, what's the purpose if, if, if all we're doing is putting chicken fire, chicken wire around the prison, you know, it's not really, you know, doing anything to prevent um, breakout. So, um, so what we want to get to when we're doing, looking at container security, we're always sort of taking that middle ground. We're always trying to get to the, the point of being just right <clears throat> for, for security. Um, and that's really what Goldilocks is about, all about. So when we look at, um, you know, when I look at container security, I, I realize that uh, uh, no one ever uh, turns you know, turns security up, right? They 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 basically, um, you know, you know, people never run the commands. Podman run cap capability um, uh, remove. Uh, there's a typo on the slide, uh, but basically they, they they never say you know take away some. Uh, you know, take away some privileges from my container. Um, what they usually do is, is things like run privileged, right? So if I'm running a container and it doesn't work, they're just going to run Podman run privileged and, and the container works and they're happy, uh, even though they've turned off all the security. Um, and then, of course, historically with SE Linux, um, the joke is always, you know, how do you handle SE Linux? Well, you set and force zero, uh, which you know, basically moves everybody back to uh, you know, the mama bear moment. And uh, um, so, so bottom line with container security is is people take the defaults or they turn it off. So anytime people come into the equation, um, th those are really the two choices uh, we do. So um, because of that, you know, again, we go with m the medium level, right? We get the uh, uh, the Goldilocks, you know, the mi the middle ground. And so the rest of this talk is going to be talking about, you know, how do I take, you know, move from Goldilocks towards Papa Bear? How do I get users to run in more, you know, more securely um, and without the users having to do anything because if the users, again, if the users have to do anything, all they're gonna do is turn things off. Um, uh, how do I get to more security without the user taking action? So one of the things we look at uh, is sort of forcing the users to be more secure. Um, so when, when it comes to running a container, uh, when you wanna run a container in the environment, um, usually there's three different entities that have input into running the running the container. And the first one we're going to look at is actually the user. All right. So, you know, basically someone sitting, you know, running a podman command or a Docker command or, you know, launching a Kubernetes um, or an OpenShift um, container, right? They're going to launch a container. They're going to write a YAML file to launch the container. Uh, well, one of the things that we we've done in OpenShift is we've sort of changed the default. If you run, you know, if anybody runs containers in, uh, you know, Podman or Docker, they usually default to running as root. Um, but OpenShift basically out of the box forces everybody to run as non-root um, and, and basically makes you have to jump through hoops to 
uh, you know, to basically run a root running container, um, which you know, sort of forces good practice into the to the users. But we have to also, you know, the developers have to develop the containers so they'll just work in non root environments. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to use a little stick towards the developers or, or towards you know, everybody that's building container images to move move them to the ability to run as non root. And that that to me is one of the key factors in getting. Um, containers to be more secure in your environment is just get rid of root altogether. Um, you know, so I wrote an article back in uh, 2018, but basically said, just say no to root inside of containers. And I really talked a lot about a lot of the security features we have to add to containers is all about getting rid of root, right? Getting rid of th this powerful root user in the system. Um, and, and really containers, you know, and just about all the workloads don't need don't need root. The, the, theoretically, the only reason you need root is to modify the system. And really, we want we don't want containers running the system, right? Your your web services, your databases, they all run perfectly fine without being root in the system. It's just that you know it's really because of the way we build container images and the way we traditionally install software is we make an assumption that the system, you know, when a machine boots up the process, the, the Apache server is going to get started by root and then be, you know, it'll drop privileges. Uh, whatever, but in a container world though, we really want to start applications right off the bat without privileges. So it's a little different mindset from sort of traditional way we install software. So the next, the next entity when we want to run a container on a system is is the container engine, okay? And and the container engine, um, you know, you know that everybody you know is familiar with is, is Docker. And um, but Docker was is sort of a you know a tool for all entities. Um, so you know if you think about you know what provides the default. You know, SE Linux label. What provides the default list of capabilities? What default provides the default list of seccops? That's all in the container engine. Well, I, I've always had a big problem with the Docker daemon in that it runs as root, right? And it, it basically, you know, it's a, a big daemon that all the anybody interacting with it has to, you know, connect over a, a socket and be able to launch the containers. Well, you know. I like to differentiate when I look at containers. I run containers underneath Kubernetes is is containers in production, right? So when I run my containers in production, I really want to write them a lot tighter um, security-wise than maybe when I'm developing containers. So if I'm just playing around with containers, uh, you know, or even when I'm building containers, I need different privileges than when I'm you know running containers in production. But if we only have one container engine, and that container engine has you know, it's hard coded defaults inside of it, then all of a sudden all different types of workloads end up being a standard, um, you know, following the same rules. So running containers in production, building containers or playing with containers all have the same default rules from a security point of view. And I'd really like to at least take the ones running my production and move them closer to Papa Bear, right? So one of the things we've done over the last couple of years is we took what was the Docker daemon and looked at the functionality that it did, and we broke it into a series of other container engines. So we have Cryo as a container engine whose main job, his only job, is to run Kubernetes, and that's running containers in production. And because of that, we ship Cryo with tighter security than we would ship, you know, uh, say the Docker daemon um, or even Podman and the other tools. Uh, Podman was a tool to, you know, to implement pretty much the Docker command line tool originally, although, um, and, and our goal was to make, you know, running containers, switching from Docker to something else as easy as possible. So we really just copied the entire CLI. Um, but we used some new concepts and, and what I felt was a better security model of using sort of standard client server model um, instead of using the client server model, to use the fork exec model so that, you know, Podman is a parent of the, of the container that it's launching. Um, and then Builder is a is lastly is a, a tool for building container images, supports things like Docker files, but actually also allows you to just create a directory on disk and put content into it and really allow you to really get deep down and controlling on what's going inside of your container images. Uh, but the, the really interesting thing that happened when we built these container engines is, is people started experimenting and adding features to actually allow them all to run without requiring root, well, not cryo, but to Podman and Builder. And we started to see that since we had sort of smaller subsets, we could start combining them back up. So imagine running a 
your Kubernetes cluster and you take a bunch of builders and, and stick them into them. And now you can have your entire CI CD system running inside of Kubernetes uh, with you know, locked down builder containers locked down by the Kubernetes environment. Um, as If you try to do that with Docker, what people do is they inject the Docker socket into the cryo into the Kubernetes containers and then, you know, allow them to talk to the Docker socket. And years ago, I wrote an article that said access to the Docker socket is the most dangerous thing you can do on a computer system because you can basically become root, take over the machine and then eliminate all logging that you did it. Um, so anyway, so, so that's one way to get more security is by breaking apart you know, each of the container operations into each container engine and then the container engines can have different defaults. So the, the last step is is, uh, you know, is basically the person, the engineer, the developer who's developing the application that you're going to run inside of a container. Um, and that, that's the person that's building, you know, OCI images, the images that sit out at Docker I.O. And, and, and Builder I.O. And most of the rest of this talk is going to be talk about some of my my ideas about how we could do a better job you know, get, getting more input from the developer into saying my container will run perfectly fine with these tight of security controls um, and then, you know, give us an opportunity. Because right now there's no way for the developer to actually give input into what security controls that his application needs in the system. It just hasn't been built into, um, you know, into the OCI at this point. So let's look at a couple of things. Um, so we talked earlier about, you know, you know, running containers and the problem of running as root. Um, and, you know, but sometimes people have to run as root. And, and over, over time, um, we've looked at, uh, you know, there's, there's a concept of Linux kernel called capabilities. And what capabilities are is, is basically, you know, we took the power, of the, the Linux kernel engineers took the power of root and divided them into originally 32 capabilities and later on to 64 capabilities. Um, and um, right now, actually, there's 37 capabilities, uh, as last time I looked anyways. Um, so there's 37 different parts, sections of, of running this route. And, and surprisingly, we can run most containers with only 14 capabilities. So only 14 capabilities, that's sort of what you know, we, over, the, over the years has evolved as to the uh, list of capabilities. But if I asked everybody on this, if I gave everybody on, online right now a test and said, what are those 14 capabilities? I would bet you almost everybody would fail to answer all 14 of them. Um, even I would fail to list all 14 of them. So um, again, they were designed by the Docker project and do you know what they are? Well, here they are. These are the 14 capabilities that are allowed by default by Docker, by Podman, by Builder. Um, so these are sort of the, the default list of capabilities. Um, but they've sort of evolved, right? They, they you know, wasn't written in stone that these, these are necessary. Um, and um, so they, they just sort of evolved. And, and I, I have four of them I'm going to talk about right now that um, I, you know, uh, I really don't think should be allowed by default, but again, they were they were allowed by default from the beginning, and, and I'm trying to really get it turned off. So audit write is the first one I'm going to talk about. Audit write was a capability um, that allows you to um, to basically write messages and, and write to the auditing subsystem. Um, so you write messages like you know Dan Walsh just logged on to the system. So, so you wouldn't think that you'd want a container to have that capability, right? To be able to modify something. You know, audit log is supposed to be this this high security system, uh, you know, for logging what's going on in the system, and and to have a containerized process have out of the box have ability to write it. So why is that on by default? Well, historically, that's on by default because when people first started running containers. Um, you know, using containers, when, one of the first things they did is they they put the SSH daemon inside of them. So they, you know, everybody thought they were like VMs, and you put the SSH daemon and then you SSH into your container. Um, and, you know, obviously that's not what you need. You just, you know, do a Podman exec and you get into the container. You, you don't have to use a daemon to get into it. Um, uh, but because people did that, everybody was constantly failing when they were running Docker with SSH daemon listening, and it was always blowing up, and it was blowing up because they didn't have cap audit right. Um, so when you log into a system, there's an audit record written, the fact that you, you know, that Dan Walsh logged onto the system. Um, so SSH daemon was blowing up, and out of the box, we allowed audit right, or, you know, the powers that be, the, the upstream community um, decided to just allow audit right. 
Why is it still on at this point? Nobody runs this as HDMI inside of it, but it's real hard to go back and, and remove certain things. The next one I'm going to talk about is Make Node. And Make Node was, uh, it allows you to create device nodes. Now, in a container, you know, the container engine goes out and creates all the device nodes that it wants you to use. So it creates, you know, basically all the content that's in slash dev and only creates devices that, um, you know, it figures that you need or, you know, it's not putting in, you know, uh, physical devices, you know, to physical disk devices, things like that. Um, and then you as a, you know, the users can add additional devices if it wants. Now, make note is, is basically allows you to do a make note and, um, you know, which is required basically a root privilege. Um, so uh, it's kind of a dangerous capability because, you know, theoretically you could create device nodes that you could use then to attack the Linux kernel. Now, there are other, other features of Linux that prevent certain, you know, we have uh, um, C groups controls, and at least in um, in uh, V two ver V one version, and then we have some EBPF to prevent uh, to control so sort of which devices you're able to make. But for the most part, you don't need device. You know, you don't need Make Node to do anything. So why is Make Node on? Well, it turns out that certain uh, images, certain builds um, in the world, you know, need Make Node to be able to build containers. Um, so they create device nodes on the fly, you know, during during in, installation. Um, now, I, I mean, this is all something I heard about years and years ago. But you know, but if, again, if you're running containers inside of cryo, you know, you're not you're probably not going to be doing that. Um, so, or you at least should not have it on by default, and just have your builder containers get it get it by default. Um, so the another one I you know I have a problem with is is syscharoot. Um, and we go back and forth on this. So Chirrut is a mechanism for creating a, a um, you know, Chirrut environment. But if you're already in a container, you're really sort of like in a Chirrut on steroids. Um, but uh, we're experimenting back and forth. Turns out some RPM builds need um, Chirrut. So I, I'm not sure we're going to be able to get rid of this one. But that's another one. It's just like it just seems kind of, you know, shouldn't be on by default. And then the last one, probably the worst one, is NetRaw. As a matter of fact, we regularly hear about CVEs um, dealing with NetRaw. NetRaw allows you to create a uh, ICMP packet, basically it allows you to create any kind of IP packet in the universe. And NetRaw has been used to break out of uh, secure virtualization. So you know, basically to, if you get assigned a VPN, uh, you know, a virtual private network and don't get access to the host network, um, there's been occasions when people have been able to format uh, certain types of packets, send them out on the VPN, and have those packets somehow break out of the VPN and get you know get out onto the rail network or, or whatever. Um, so you know, having that raw on by default is, is really curious. But you know, why do we allow that by default? And, and it turns out the reason we're allowing it by default is is for the ping command. So people, when they set up containers, they want to go into the container and be able to make sure it can reach certain networks. And the way most admins or developers do that is they use the ping command. And ping creates an ICMP packet, which is not allowed by default and requires net raw. Well, what we've done in containers is we actually, there is another tool in uh, in Linux uh, syscontrol that could be turned on to allow non-root users and non you know, users without net raw to actually do pings without requiring um, um, without requiring a, um, a raw capability. So what I'm going to show you right now is what happens when So what I'm going to show right now is a little demonstration of you know what happens when you take away net raw capability from um, oops you don't this is probably why I should record this. Okay, so here we have sort of a standard podman running a container and it's just doing a ping, right? So by, out of the box, as I said, we have default 
uh, capabilities for NetRaw, and that allows you to ping. So the next step is I'm going to run a container now. In this case, I'm going to drop NetRaw, and boom, it blows up. So just, you know, I have a ping, you're basically a, a container image that tries to do a ping. Um, we disable NetRaw, and all of a sudden, ping is broken. But there is a syscontrol that's been available for, for I think, about seven or eight years in the Linux kernel uh, called uh, IP, you know, net IPv4 ping user range. And what this allows you is to, for a range of UIDs on your system, um, to allow any anybody that's in that group um, to be able to do a ping. So what I want to do is I'm going to do a uh, drop the net raw capability again, and all I'm going to do is set the syscontrol. And boom, I get capabilities. So now I'm running a container that's much more secure. Um, and that, that syscontrol that I just set is actually set just for the container. So it hasn't loosened up the security um, on the rest of the system. It doesn't, you know, theoretically, if you're worried about other users on the system being able to ping or other containers being able to ping. But it's a, it's a fairly easy thing to, to change. And, and instantaneously, um, you get a little bit more security. So that's kind of cool that we could do that. Um, and um, you know, just as an idea of you know, different ways we could actually move towards Papa Bear. So now we're gonna look at, um, you know, imagine a, a developer has figured out in his image that he wants, uh, you know, certain, um, you know, he figures out that his container image only needs a couple of, uh, a couple of capabilities. Um, say it only needs set UID and set GID. Um, so what would be really cool is if, if they could add a, a label, something, you know, some content to the image that says, you know, my image only needs these two capabilities. And what could happen then is the container engines like Podman and Cryo could actually pull down the container image and, and take that, that label, read that label, and figure out if those two capabilities are currently are allowed in the default capabilities. So what's going to happen is, is if... You know, the image says, I only need set UID and set GID. Podman goes, looks at his default list and says, oh, I already allow set UID and set GID. Instead of allowing all 14 capabilities, then it could just say, okay, I'm going to launch the container just with the two, UI, two capabilities it needs. Now, if the image came along and said it needed a capability that isn't in the, in the default list, then it could at least, you know, currently in, in Podman, what happens is it'll blow up and basically, but it'll tell you that this container in order to run needs this capability. So let's take a look at, the, at that. So here we have, I'm creating a container, um, basically just a Fedora container that's gonna have, um, you know, says that it needs set UID and set GID. Um, and I'm gonna create a container and basically with Podman and because it pulled down the Fedora capability, it, you know, created that container, um, it, basically launches the container and, and shows that it's running with um, um, the default capabilities of set UID and set GID. If I run a standard container, um, you know, basically a regular container on the system, a default container, um, you see that, you know, Podman basically will run with the 14 capabilities that we've been talking about during this talk. So now I'm going to create another container image, and this time I'm going to use ones that aren't in the list of, of the 14. I'm going to run Podman. And what happens now is Podman will come out and, and uh, actually contain, create the container with the default 14 list, but it'll actually report an error to you saying that the capabilities requested by the user or an image are not allowed by default, cap net admin and cap sysadmin. Um, so, um, so you see, we still go back to the 14 if you ask for ones that aren't in the list. But if you decide that you want to run the container um, and with those capabilities, because it doesn't work for whatever reason, you can actually go back and, and run the container again and just add that to your fault list. So there's the commands to add those capabilities. And so this is a mechanism for the developer to at least communicate back to the, the user that, hey, my container will you know, needs these two capabilities to run properly. And that, that's documented nowhere in the, in the system. Um, and so, you know, all of a sudden, you know, his container will run perfectly well as long as it has those two capabilities. So it gives a mechanism for the developer to actually document in his container, um, you know, the way that he, he wants the containers to run, you know, which capabilities they want to get run. So similar to that, another feature that we use for securing containers is a thing called SecComp. 
And, and really what SecComp is all about is controlling the number of syscalls that are available to containers. So it, it limits the, you know, it, right now there's about six, 600 syscalls on an x86 system. And when we use SecComp, um, we're able to limit the, uh, filter the number of syscalls that a container can do. Um, so right now, you know, uh, well, let's just say that there's four, 450 on a standard uh, Linux box. I think it's actually a lot more than that if you include the 32-bit uh, code. But um, so out of a, uh, right now, you know, we have a SecOM filter that basically identifies which syscalls are available to, uh, uh, to the system when we run containers. And what happens is we're allowing about 300 Linux syscalls out of approximately 450 plus the 32-bit syscall. So we eliminate the 32-bit syscalls, and then we eliminate about 150 other syscalls uh, when we run containers. That's pretty good, but 300 syscalls is, is quite, a, quite a bit, right? So can we do better? Uh, so Aquasec wrote an article um, back in uh, 2019 that said that they believe that most containers can run with only 40 to 70 syscalls. So right now we're running, we're giving 300 syscalls when we potentially could only need, you know, uh, you know, far less than 100 syscalls to be able to run. And wouldn't it be good to eliminate those additional syscalls? But of course, there's no way for, for anybody to figure out which syscalls their container image actually makes. So last summer, a year ago, uh, summer, we, we actually worked with a uh, Google Summer of Code uh, and we created a new uh, open source project called the OCI SecComp BPF hook. And what this, this hook does is actually plugs into containers and actually just watches which syscalls are uh, being used inside of a container. Um, and then it'll generate a SecComp profile file by tracing all the syscalls. And then you can use that um, later to lock down your container. So. This gives you a quick idea of, you know, this is a configuration file for the SecComp hook. Um, and what this is basically, you know, the, the interesting thing here on the, uh, in the screen is that you can basically set this up to permanently sit on your system, just install it on your system. But then if you want to trace um, uh, syscalls, you can set what's called an annotation. It's basically a command line option to Podman or to Cryo, and you can put it in your Kubernetes YAML um, to say, basically, I want this actual container image or this pod to be traced, to basically have all the syscalls recorded inside of it. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually um, use Podman, and I'm going to run uh, the annotations call to basically say, I want to write run Fedora LS of slash, basically just looking at LS of slash, and I'm telling the syscall uh, filter to record all of the SecCom, um, uh, uh syscalls that are uh, ha happening there. Um, and there, it just ran ran the command, tra traced all of the uh, syscalls, and it created, if you look up here, you'll see that I'm telling it to store them all into a file called uh, mysecomp.json, and now, if I look at my seccomp.json, this shows you all of the syscalls that LS of slash uh, uses when it wants to run a container. Uh, so you see, you know, whatever. So it's about it's probably about 25 or 30 syscalls here. Um, so now what I'm going to do is now I'm going to put it in enforcing mode. So instead of you now, instead of using the filter, I'm actually going to use the generated seccomp file for um, the container. Uh, oh, by the way, I didn't mention earlier in my talk that uh, these SecComp rules for you know, the, those default 300 syscalls were actually developed by Docker, actually by Jesse Frizzell, who was the, the one who led it. Um, and, you know, it just went back and forth. And they, they basically tried to find out what the real Goldilocks, you know, what, what you know, will the bulk of all containers run with um, on the system. So it was a real Goldilocks moment. But here we have a real Papa Bear and that I can run the container with just the syscalls that the container needs to be able to run. So obviously that's a much more secure way of running a container. If it, you know, something hacks into my system and causes a different syscall to be used, it'll be blocked by the kernel. Um, so here I'm gonna run the exact same command, but this time I'm ask, adding the dash L, the dash long flag to the LS command, and you're gonna see that the container is gonna blow up. So that shows that the uh, container actually you know, was blocked, seccom, they tried to do some syscalls that weren't allowed by, the, by default. Um, I'm not sure why my auditing system is not logging it right now, but there should be records in the auditing subsystem to say that the syscalls, you know, are used, but I'll show you them in a minute. 
Uh, so what, what we're going to do now is um, I'm going to use the annotation again. Uh, so I put it out of enforcing mode, sort of, and back into a permissive mode. And this time it's going to take the original file, so an input file of my set comp. It's going to create my, and then going to generate a new file called my set comp 2.json. So basically it's just sort of, you know, uh, taking his input what was allowed before and then getting the new ones. And now I'm just running the ls-l command to uh, you know get the long listing uh, of slash. And there you see a long listing of slash inside of my container. And now if I run the same command in, in lockdown mode with the new uh, file, it works instantaneously. Now I have you know a, a broader sense of syscalls that are available um, to the container to be able to run. Um, and if we want to look at, you know, what what did dash L add, you know, what, why did, you know, dash L not work? And it basically didn't work because it needed these syscalls. Um, so if you understand the way Linux works uh, on the system, um, you know, it, some of these syscalls I can explain to you. Um, so when I do in that dash L, that tells it to basically, you know, instead of showing uids to you it actually needs to translate the uid into you know something like dwalsh on the system the way that happens underneath the in the linux system is you know basically you know, ordinarily just reads etsy password and, and translates it but on a modern modern linux systems um it's a little bit more complicated than that actually the the uh the the ls command is actually using um, a feature in glibc called ns switch and then the switch is set up by default instead of reading the etsy password file directly it actually goes out to a daemon it connects over a unix domain socket to a daemon called sss daemon um, so it needs to connect in order to connect to that daemon and then it needs you know the socket connection to be able to communicate back and forth it also does things like get the X adders out of the, the file system. It, you know, so that, that's basically all of these additional things are needed when we go up with the, but the basic idea is that you can um, sort of continue to watch a container image and, and you further generate more and more syscalls. So obviously out of the box, you can't you know, figure out all possible ways people are gonna run an image, but imagine you run in a Kubernetes cluster and you could basically say, I'm gonna put this new application through my CI CD system. I'm gonna run all of my tests on it. I'm gonna have the syscall filtering tool watching it constantly. Um, and once it gets out of the CI CD system, I have you know probably a pretty good idea of the syscalls that are used to run that container. Now I can take that container and put it into production with those syscalls and actually have another tool, you know, just use the filter again. And this time the filter is, you know, watching for additional syscalls. Um, and say you run it for three months in sort of that permissive mode. And after three months, if you find no additional syscalls, you know, being added, then probably at that point you say, maybe I can put it into enforcing mode. But basically this gives you the tools to be able to, um, to uh, you know, basically monitor a container and do it. So imagine you know we could take similar to what we talked about before with capabilities. Imagine I could take this generated seccom file and actually you know how do I distribute that to the environment? And what I would subscribe is that we put that seccom file inside the the actually inside of the OCI, um, you know the 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 JSON that describes what's inside the image. The developer could basically go out, figure out what seccomp rules his container image needs, and then associate it with the image and embed it. Then the container tools could be made smart enough to basically look at what they're giving for the default, those default 300 syscalls that it gives, and look at the, the, the ones that the container image is asking for, and make sure that you know if the default 300, you know, if the, the image asks for all of the same allow rules that are in the default 300, then they're just run in a much tighter environment and it has to be no in interaction with the user. Um, there has to be no interaction with you know, uh, you know, software management or anything else. It just would work out of the box. Okay, so SE Linux, uh, I often talk about how great SE Linux is for um, securing the system. And if you look at just the number of, of uh, security vulnerabilities that SE Linux has blocked in the container world, it's, it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, the last one here, the last CV down here actually was a CV that allowed a root process to overwrite 
the tool to launch the container. So, you know, Run C um, is the tool that you know, people use to configure all their containers. So imagine if you ran a container that had this vulnerability, you could overwrite Run C, and then all future containers that get launched would be under your control. Um, so SC Linux actually protects the file system. Uh, from container escape, and that's usually where the container escapes is by you know getting out to the file system and, and being able to wreak havoc. Um, and SC Linux basically keeps things contained. So it's block most containers, best tool in my opinion for file system escape. Um, but SC Linux has additional features like it, it has the ability to control capabilities. But we we basically you know, for the default policy, we allow containers to have all access to all. Linux capabilities and have full access to the network. So we're not using that parts of SC Linux to control because we're relying on other parts of the kernel for doing that. So, so you know, sort of, again, it's the Goldilocks, right, uh, to control. Uh, but uh, so one of the problems that when people, you know, containers work real, real well with SC Linux, but the one area where people fall into issues with uh, SC Linux is around volumes. So, um, you know, basically a volume is a way of exposing parts of the operating system into the container to take parts of the file system and inject them into the container. And uh, so SE Linux, uh, you know, functionality that was added to Docker and Podman, um, you know, realized that, you know, any content that you take from the, from the host is going to be labeled incorrectly for use with the container. So we added uh, an option to the volume mount, uh, you know, lowercase z and capital Z. And then what the capital Z does is basically tells the container engine podman here to fix the labels on that directory and it just runs a recursive change of all the content. So if you basically run a MariaDB and you want to have the database stored on your disk, you can just you know, create a directory, mount it into the container, use a control Z, capital Z, and uh, Podman will relabel that directory and all your content for that directory will be private to that container. The lowercase z's allows you to have it public, uh, public to all containers, uh, but still be isolated all the rest of the content from the host. But the second line down here, uh, Podman run by a log, um, it could be a problem. So if you were running a Fluent D daemon and you wanted to have access to all the logs on the host um, in order to say export them, uh, running the cap colon Z here would be a real serious issue because it would basically relabel all the content in my log. And you know, we might have other, there's, there's probably other parts of your system that are confined that aren't allowed to write to a container label. Um, but need to write to the bio log. So, you know, you, you'd have lots and lots of the system would blow up if you, you know, run a colon Z at a higher level. And so this is the usual place where SE Linux sort of, you know, users stumble upon it. So what do we do for the, that situation? Because we don't want people relabeling, you know, system directories like that. That's a bad idea or the host will break. And so the only option by default is to basically turn SE Linux off for the container. Um, to re really basically, you know, execute a security op label equals disabled, which tells the container not to use SE Linux separation. But that kind of sucks because you know, I just told you that, you know, SE Linux is probably the best tool for a container separation that we have. And now we turn it off for, you know, a fairly common use case. So the, the upstream SE Linux maintainers have built a new tool called Uditsa. Uh, Utica for us Americans, uh, but Uditsa is a tool that can actually go out and it understands containers and understands the, um, the the JSON file that's associated with containers. So it basically will examine, you build a container and it will examine the content of that container and will generate an SE Linux policy based on that. Oops. Well, let's see if we can get this running. So here I'm gonna run a container on my system and I volume mounted in slash home into the container in vast pool. This is a standard one with SE Linux in enforcing mode. Um, and if I do an LS of home, it gives me permission denied, right? Because we, we don't want if a container broke out to be able to go out and read the home directory of a user. And similarly, if I wanted to, you know, we mounted this uh, vast spool as being real, world writable or rewritable. If I wanted to go out and, and do something there, I'm also going to get permission denied there. From SE Linux is the only thing that's preventing this on the system, uh, but you know, you're sort of stuck. So if you wanted a container that did this, um, you would basically have to, um, you know, run the machine and you know with SE Linux disabled for the containers. So now I'm going to take Uditsa. And, and basically, I'm going to look at the container I just generated and pipe it into Uditsa. Uh, 
so right there, I inspected it. And what happened just in that inspection, Udita went out and generated policy. So here's a couple of commands. Um, so I'm about to execute two commands to update the SC Linux policy on the system to basically be able to create a new policy type for my container. So now instead of the first time, I just ran with a standard label, but now I'm going to run my container with my generated um, type. So it created, this created a new my container process type, but that's the only thing that's changed. So instead of having to run SE Linux disabled for this container, I could actually generate a policy for the container uh, that easily. And here you can see the container running on my system uh, with the new label. And now I'm going to enter the container. And if I go into slash home, I see content. And if I go out and I touch content and bar spool in, I get able to do it. So this container is still under confinement, uh, but the only thing it's able to do now is read the content that's in slash home and actually, you know, and, and write to content in bar spool. And so now you could take something like the Fluent D uh, container that we showed earlier and actually running with Etsy Linux in enforcing mode, still locked down, but slightly looser, slightly closer to Mama Bear, as opposed to going all the way past Mama Bear to being disabled. Um, so the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, in, in this session is user namespace. So user namespace is a um, uh, is something that sort of people have, have dreamed about for years and years. Um, and the, the basic idea is uh, user namespace allows us to map non-root users, uh, you know, give give root to a container. Um, but not be root in the system. So if you broke out of a container, even though you root inside the container, if you broke out, you would be uh, uh, non-root. And so this is this is actually the secret of Podman. Is Podman? You know, when you're running rootless Podman and rootless builder, we're actually using the user namespace. So we're using namespace allows us to fake you out. So you know, when you look at root inside of your rootless container, uh, if you went if you left that. Uh, container and look to that process, that process is actually just you. It's your UID. Um, so all we're doing is mapping your UID inside of the container, uh, your UID outside of the container to be a root inside of the container. The problem is that other than Podman, you know, none of these, you know, Cryo and uh, Kubernetes and, you know, Docker and, and stuff like that has ever used user namespace. Um, so really, we're not using it for uh, container separation. There has been some efforts to potentially run your container engine in a user namespace, but not to have each container launched with a different user namespace. Um, so with user namespace, it'd be really cool if we launched every single container with a different user namespace for you know, well, each container with a different user namespace. Um, and you know, we're, we're working towards that and we're hoping to get into Kubernetes uh, soon. Um, so there is some features you know, that are lacking, but we're building up our tooling to be able to do things like uh, you know, fixing up the file systems to be able to work. Um, and so here I'm going to do a quick demo of... Uh, user namespace. So Podman has built in, you can specify user namespace. I can take a container. And if I looked inside the container right now, um, if I enter that container, it says it's running as root. But if I look at, you know, I use Podman top here to show you that that container is actually running as UID 100,000. Um, and here, you know, if I actually examine the system to look at that sleep command I just executed, you see it's running as 100,000 on the system. Um, and then if I launch the second container, as UID 200,000. Um, the reason this is pausing is actually choning the file. Okay, so now created a, a second container. So now I have two containers on my system uh, running. Both of them think they have, or both of them have root inside of the container. They're able to do things like root inside of the container and have multiple UIDs. But on the host, you know, one's running as two, UID 200, 100,000, the other one's running as UID. 200,000. If those container processes broke out and got access to the system, the system would just treat them as UID 100,000, UID 200,000. So they wouldn't have any power, you know, it basically sort of this standard security that we've been relying on for, you know, 50 years in, in Linux, um, you know, we'd have full UID protections. Um, so we've added a new, f the, the problem with that is, you know, you have to, you know, the user again has to be able to uh, figure out which use a namespace to use to, to basically make sure each one of its containers is secure. Uh, so we've added a flag to, to Podman again to basically automatically pick uh, unique user namespaces. So this one went out and picked 
uh, this huge number as the, the process running on the system is running as, at that huge number. And now I'm going to run another container. It's going to pick a huge different number. Um, so, uh, so now we're basically, you know, we don't have to do any smarts on the system. And basically Podman in its database is, or is in storage is actually keeping track of all the user namespaces that it's using and, and able to give you different um, you know, different user namespaces for each one of them. So here I created another one, and this just shows you what the mapping inside of the container looks like. So this one says that it's mapping UID zero to this gargantuan number, and then, you know, we, we asked for only 5,000 UIDs. So it basically maps the next 5,000 UIDs into the container, and you can take advantage of user namespace. Uh, Podman under the covers is setting that up to, um, to um, be able to, um, you know, use those, uh, you know, random UIDs and, and fixing up the file systems and things like that so that everything will work. Um, so right now there's a pull request inside into Cryo. I think it's just been uh, merged to allow Cryo to do similar functionality to that. So Cryo um, will be able to launch lots and lots of containers underneath Kubernetes, each one of them inside of their own user namespace. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and see if anybody's asked any questions. Has someone been reading the questions to ask them? I can do that. That'd be great. So um, Mike asks that these runtime namespace selections are separate from what we would previously have to specify in uh, etc sub id file so the etc sub uid file and etc sub gid file is is something that is specified for each user on the system what i'm trying to show here is i'm running um, lots and lots of containers as root and then putting them into separate user namespaces. We can do similar with rootless containers, except that the number of UIDs that I've allocated, right? So by default, a, a user running um, on a Linux system gets 65,000 UIDs. If he's going to create multiple containers um, using auto equals uh, F, you know, he's he's going to use up his number of UIDs very quickly, um, as opposed to if you root on the system, you have, you know, basically 4 billion UIDs. So if you're even allocating at 65,000 UIDs each, um, you can get better separation. So the real goal to me is is not, you know, while it's a cool feature for rootless, um, it's also a, a much cooler feature if you're running a server with lots and lots of services running on it. Um, and those services require real root um, to use user namespace. And, and really the, the end goal, the real goal is to get this into Kubernetes so that uh, Kubernetes could launch, you know, 50, 200, 300 containers, each one in different user namespaces. And, you know, we basically added another layer of, of defense. Okay, so um, James Kessel asks that um, it's ordered to allow for containers. Yeah, it's actually smarter than order to allow. So order to allow just basically waits till something goes wrong. And then uh, this is Utica, uh, Uditsa. Uh, order to allow just reads what's written to the audit log. These are things that were blocked by, um, you know, SE Linux and then basically adds allow rules. What Uditsa does is actually looks at those two volumes that were mounted into the container and see it figures out, oh, uh, he needs to be able to read, you know, it's a read only flag on the slash home directory. So it generates policy that says he can read any type that is defined and stored underneath slash home. Um, similarly, the vast spool was read writable. It looks at vast spool, looks at the SC Linux policy that's installed in the machine and generates policy that says it can re read and write any types that are stored under vast spool. So it's it's a really sort of an intelligent and, and creative way of handling this. But yeah, it's it's not an after the fact. It's basically before you run a container, you basically define you design your container and then realize that SC Linux is going to be a problem, and you run Uditsa to examine how the container is and says it comes back and says, oh, this container would run better if it has uses this SC Linux type and generates the policy to be used. Right, um, and finally we had. Michelle Salim asked that, is overlaying the labels an option? I guess this is in context with the yeah. Linux files. Yeah, so, 
So really you're talking, I think what you're asking there is could I have two different types for a file? You know, or could I somehow, um, I guess, do a bind mount and have it change the label um, of the files? And, and really from a security point of view, SE Linux has always blocked that capability for going into the Linux kernel um, because they believe that uh, uh, if I have two types on a single file on the system, um, it, you know, the, the security of the, of the files is not, you can't judge it, right? So it's sort of, you know, basically they want every object to have a single label on it. And then you enforce that label based off of, you know, a, a, a you know, there's an analysis that can happen at that point by the kernel to make sure that you, this process only has it. And, it's, and they need to have ways of discovering and studying the, those, those types. So they never allowed... Um, two types to be stored on a single file at a single single time. Uh, as far as bind mounts, you know, there is a uh, SE Linux thing called a context mount. So when I do a mount of, say, an NFS directory, I can say this NFS directory is going to be a, a container file T type, but um, bind mounts don't support that, mainly for the same reason that, you know, so it would be easy to confuse the Linux kernel if you, you were able to do bind mounts. Great. So we have one more question. Mike asks that the Eureka rules are specific to the image containers that they were generated against. Uh, it's well, theoretically, yes. I mean, because it, it's yes, it's 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 more towards the container than the image because it's it's examining the the volumes and capabilities and things like that that you put when you ran the container. So the, in this case, the developer of of the application is designed, say, a podman or a Docker command to execute his container. And, you know, you might specify, you know, somewhere in a help document, this is a command I would suggest that you would run for running the container. And what Udita would then do is look at that and be able to generate policy on the fly to to allow you to control what that container does in the system from an the point of view. Great. I think that's the end of all the questions. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Dan. I think this talk was really informative. Yeah. I, for one, didn't know I could do 300 syscalls from my container. Okay. So, so that's great. Yeah. If, you um, look, if you want to look at the syscalls, go to uh, usershiacontainers.com.json. That's the whole list. Okay. Right. I guess I'm, I think someone's supposed to be talking right now, so I got to get out. All right. Bye now.